Hi everyone, my name is Spencer. I'm a fourth year computer science public service student here at Davis. Um, and I'm excited to be sharing with you my topic today, which is micro-targeting, the swing voter, and the ground campaign. How political practitioners and political scientists both understand persuadable voters. Um, I did this through the sponsoring department of the University Honors Program, and with the uh, awesome help and without his help, I could not have accomplished my research journey of Professor Christopher Hare of the Political Science Department. Um, so, just starting with the brass tacks basics, what do campaigns even do? The 100% drive of a campaign worker every day is to make sure that you wake up on election day and you won. So, you got to get 50% plus one vote share. And so, we're going to be driving towards that goal every step of the way when we're working on campaigns. But how do you get to 50% plus one? Uh, obviously, you got to build that coalition somehow. So, every campaign is going to need to mobilize their supporters to get those votes. And then, of course, depending on the size of the district, the type of election, the type of office, uh, you're definitely going to have to go out and persuade people who don't know you uh, to come out and join that 50% plus one well coalition to get you elected. How do you do that? Uh, we do this through various voter contact efforts. I'm sure all of us have engaged with this at some point in our lives. Uh, so campaigns go out and knock on doors, they call voters, they send them mail, and they serve them advertisements on television and online. Um, so this is important to keep in mind what campaigns are actually physically doing. Um, uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. So <clears throat> in order to do that, though, you're not going to go and knock on every single door of everyone who lives in the district. That would be inefficient because not everyone's registered to vote. But even amongst those registered voters, not everyone's going to show up on election day, and they're certainly not all going to support you. So targeting is this idea of trying to figure out exactly who you should be talking to on election day to make all of those voter contact efforts more effective and to get more bang. So, uh, just to lead us into targeting here, uh, this was my favorite quote I came across in my research uh, by a political consultant who got his start working for JFK in 1960. Uh, he said, if you want to pick cherries, go where the cherries is. So, <laughs> while, while targeting has changed significantly uh, since the 1960s, that basic premise still holds. Uh, political campaigns are just trying to find where their cherries is. But now that we live in the information age, uh, the rise of big data, we're actually able to do this at a much more granular level. We're trying to find individual cherries as opposed to a larger bush. Um, so how do people do that these days? Campaigns are worried about two things about every registered voter. They want to know the chance that you're actually going to show up to vote on election day and the chance of who you're actually going to support if you do come up to vote. So uh, the way that we do that now, they're producing, uh, that we're using micro-targeting models to produce a probability score for each voter in the voter registration database. So using your voter registration information, information from the census, from state licensing agencies, uh, all that data is combined through micro-targeting uh, algorithm to produce a likelihood uh, that you're going to turn out or who you're going to support. But how do campaigns think about using these? Well, before I get into that, I do actually want to tell you how good are we actually do at doing those things. That's the first question we should all be asking ourselves. So political science has shown that we're pretty good about predicting your likelihood to turn out. Factors like age, obviously, we've heard of, prior vote history, income. These have all been proven to be related to whether or not you're likely to come up to them. We're less good at predicting partisanship using this sort of demographic information. Obviously, your race, your gender, income, those things are definitely associated with a uh, your political party, but it's less inclusive. So how do campaigns operate in this space of ambiguity is where I want to get at with my presentation today. Um, so let's think of a hypothetical voter, we'll call him Animated Spencer. <laughs> Animated Spencer, uh, once his uh, data, uh, once his demographic information was run through the micro-targeting model, comes out with a turnout probability of 95, go me, and a party score of <laughs> So that makes him a mobilization target, but what do I mean by that? Um, this is how campaigns Think about the interaction between your turnout score and your party score. So if we see on our y-axis there, we have our turnout scores plotted at 10, you're 100% likely to, to go out to vote right there at the top. At a 1, you're not likely to show up on election day. Uh, and then across our x-axis here, we have what amounts to an ideological spectrum on the far left there, represented by a 1, you have really strong Democrats. And on the far right, that's where you're going to find a really strong Republicans, represented by uh, so where does Animated Spencer go on this? With his party and turnout scores, he's very squarely in the Republican mobilization target zone. So as we can see, these edges of the graph here are where uh, campaigns think about mobilizing. So for example, if you're a Democratic campaign consultant, you're going to want to talk to the people in that mobilization zone over there and not waste any resources, door knocks, canvassing uh, effects on the people in the Republican mobilization zone. 
what are we left with when we get rid of those things? We have the persuasion universe. So here's the center of the graph here. We find some unclear scores on partisanship. We're not sure if you're a strong Democrat or a strong Republican. You fall right here in the middle. The least useful people uh, to campaigns are the people right here at the bottom of the persuasion zone. We don't know. We doubt they're going to turn out to vote. They have a very low turnout score. But we also don't know who they're going to talk, who they're going to vote for if you do convince them to go out to vote. So uh, that's a very inefficient person to try to talk to. And as you go up that graph, those are the people you want to get into. Um, so, as uh, I actually first thought of this concept when I began reading Hirsch, uh, who wrote Hacking the Electorate, and he talks about these micro-targeting models, and what he says is exactly what I just pointed out on the previous slide, which is campaigns are targeting for persuasion people who the data models just simply do not paint a clear picture of who they would support. But that differs from what political scientists in the past have found represents someone who would be likely to be persuaded to change their vote. Previous political science literature has said that if you are a uh, low information voter, you're just uninformed, you're more likely to change your mind and be persuadable. It's also found that people who have cross pressure, so cross cutting issues in their lives or identities where they feel one way about an issue and another way about another issue that's not cleanly ideological, um, those people are more likely to switch their but it doesn't have very much to do with the demographic data that these micro-targeting models are taking into account, your age. These things are not predictive of you being a more open to persuasion type of person. So that's the disconnect between what political science has found and what political campaigners are actually doing. If we uh, want to see that visualized, let's change animated Spencer to a 55 party score that gives him unclear partisanship that makes him a persuasion target. He goes right there in the center of that persuasion universe. And this matters because campaigns treat persuasion and mobilization targets differently. We may send you a different type of mail. We may emphasize a different issue. We may choose to contact or not contact you, depending on if you fall into one of those zones. And so uh, where, you know, how, how campaigns perceive you based on the data is important and it leads to distinctions. So I wanted to find out, are persuasion targets actually persuadable? Do the people who qualify as swing voters actually fall into that persuasion zone on the campaign targeting unit? And in order to do that, we wanted to look at swing voters in 2018. So how we defined that was if you voted for one party for president in 2016 and another party for Congress in 2018. Um, those people we're going to call switchers, because swing voters is kind of an all-catch-all term. We're going to focus on the switchers. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to compute those basic turnout scores using a regression model. Uh, so that way we can see and plot them along the targeting universe to find out were they actually perceived by campaigns to be persuadable, and did campaigns send them persuadable contact? So uh, I'll get into how I did that here. So uh, we use data from the Cooperative Congressional Election Study. It's used in a lot of political science literature. Um, that interviews over 50,000 people nationwide, um, and includes a lot of these same variables that campaigns are using from census data and your voter registration forms in order to create that score for you. So we did, we did use these. We created a basic score on turnout and party for every voter uh, who voted in both elections in the CCES. Uh, but in order to understand how, how well those basic scores are, we also created the enhanced score. And so the while well, the basic scores represent the information environment available to campaigns and how campaigns would perceive you, we had all these additional data points from the CCES on your specific view on abortion policy, health care, uh, whether or not you were a member of a union or new member of a union, all of these various uh, taxes, all these various sort of hot topic policy issues um, that would really help us improve that partisanship score. Because as I mentioned before, we're not super good at predicting partisanship, but once we incorporate these individual level issue attitudes, maybe we'll get at those cross pressures a little bit better. Um, and so I already gave away one of my hypotheses, uh, but I'll start from the beginning. Uh, so the first one being using only the basic scores. We're not going to do a good job at, at predicting who is persuadable by finding them in the persuasion zone of the voter universe. Um, using the enhanced scores will improve that partisanship uh, idea, and that's my second hypothesis here, is it will be a better proxy because we're incorporating all of those. Um, and then we actually don't have time to get to the turnout today, so I'm just going to stay. So expectations, there's another reprint of our campaign targeting universe up top. If the logic of that holds, then here's where you would expect to find your switchers, densely clustered right in the middle of that persuasion universe. So this is what I would expect after using those scores um, on switchers. 
Um, that's we don't have time for. Uh, so, real quick, just the results by the numbers. One, switchers are red. Uh, overall, there's only about 5.8% of the consecutive election voters were switchers. So, um, a reminder that if your campaign strategy focuses on needing to find these switchers, 94% uh, or so of the electorate was a same party voter. And so, when you're thinking about building that coalition of 50% plus one, while my presentation were really focused in on switchers, campaigns necessarily are not because that's not where the bulk of that coalition is going to come from. Uh, and then the second thing I'll note is that switchers abandoned Trump. Uh, so about two thirds of our switchers chose Trump in 2016 and a Democrat for Congress in 2018. And before you uh, celebrate or are dismayed by that information, <laughs> it's actually exactly what we might expect given previous trends. So uh, it's probably what we would have seen in the 2010 election, which was the first midterm election under a new Democratic president. Um, so we did see that. Um, but yeah, just a reminder, so switchers are rare. We want to keep that in mind. But how did it actually shake out? Uh, this is how, uh, how well did our targeting um, <clears throat> numbers actually sort persuadable voters into the persuasion zone? So there's a reprint up there of where, what we would expect. This middle graph here is what we found using the basic scores. So where the darker areas are is the higher concentration of vote switchers. As we can see, uh, it did not fall into the center of the targeting universe, as you would expect, and those people in the center is who campaigns are reaching out to is persuadable. We can see their cluster down here at the bottom of the turnout scale. Um, you can also see they're skewed to the right. That happens to be because our data comes from an election uh, in which two thirds of the voters switched away from the Republican Party, so you'll see that in our enhanced model as well. But as we can tell, Right now, using the information available to campaigns, they're not good at predicting and sending uh, resources to people in the persuasion zone uh, accurately. Once we incorporate all those issue attitudes, however, we get a much better sense of partisanship. Uh, we see that they're much more densely clustered in what is closer to the persuasion zone, of course, and so it does do a better job uh, than just the basic score when you're in that full information environment. Um, so if campaigns somehow had access to your detailed level policy positions, they might be able to better predict whether or not you're going to be a switcher, as our hypothesis Yes, but just like I was mentioning, switchers are rare. So uh, even in the highest concentration of switchers, so if you're a campaign and you bank your strategy on finding these switchers and talking to them, uh, then your best bet would be to target everyone right now under these results who comes in at a turnout score of seven and a partisanship score of six. Uh, if you were to do that, our highest density there is 28% of people who had that combination of scores were vote switchers. Um, so if your strategy relied on making sure you got all the vote switchers uh, and you decided, okay, we're going to target everyone who has that cross-section of scores, at best you're going to get about 30% switchers. Seven out of ten conversations you're going to have are not going to be with vote switchers. Again, people are very consistent with their vote choice selection. So even in a full information environment and you're getting the best targeting possible, you're still going to be pretty inefficient at finding your voters, if that's your strategy. Um, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, so just a few conclusions here. Switchers are rare. The campaigns are not super great at finding where they are. Uh, two, scores enhanced with the issue attitudes definitely get us better at predicting partisanship and thus finding uh, switchers, and they improve the accuracy of that targeting universe. Three, campaign micro-targeting models are dependent on the available data. Watch this space. What I mean by that is the people, uh, when you're thinking about these privacy laws that are being debated, both from big corporations, but also when your government wants to change the information they're asking for you to put on your voter registration information, people making those laws may benefit from having more data from you in order to better target you, in order to better find who you are. Uh, these campaign targeting decisions, they matter because they have implications for democracy. So if your data model systematically discriminates against young people um, or any other group, they're less likely to be reached out to and contacted, they're less likely then to be engaged, they're less likely to vote, they're less likely to be represented, and that has implications for legislation and democratic governance. So uh, that's why this is important. Thank you for letting me ramble. Uh, anybody have any questions?